Great, thank you very much. Thanks for having us on stage. Um, now we're going to be talking about the convergence of media, and we have a great panel lined up, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, first of all, I'll get each of the guys just to do a quick introduction so you know who, who they are and where they're sitting in case they moved around. Okay, so maybe we'll start with Shane. Hi, I'm Shane Mitchell from Media Corp. Uh, introductions, what can I say? So digital's been a, a learning experience for me for maybe 20 years now, and we keep on learning. So um, currently heading digital at Media Corp, for, which most of you will know is uh, Singapore's uh, major media company. We have interests in television, radio, uh, catch up, VOD, OTT, video services, uh, as well as a number of other businesses as well. Thanks very much. And, and now this is Mike. Hey there, uh, Mike Kriak, the Chief Operating Officer at Mashable. Uh, Mashable is a media company that reaches around 60 million people uh, on a monthly basis that focuses on telling stories about uh, the convergence of technology and culture, uh, everything from Snapchat Discover uh, to linear through partnerships uh, across the globe. Thank you very much. And Shaul? Shaul, hi. I'm uh, Shaul, uh, co-founder and CEO of Playbuzz. Playbuzz is the underlying platform behind a lot of the engaging, fun, viral content that you guys consume on different uh, uh, websites and content apps. Uh, we are a very global company with high aspirations to make a big, big move into Southeast Asia. So I'm here as part of us uh, exploring ways to work with uh, local publishers and local agencies and uh, try to replicate the same traction that we have uh, reach of over uh, 200 million unique users worldwide into the Asian market as well. Thank you very much. Okay, and David? Hello, I'm uh, David Wieland. I work for BBC Worldwide. Um, BBC Worldwide is the commercial arm of the BBC, which, as you probably know in the room, is, is one of the oldest broadcasters in the world, based in the UK. I'm actually based in Singapore and manage all of our commercial businesses across Asia. We've got channels, branded services. We distribute our programs to third party. We've got production companies. We sell formats and ancillary. And we've got nine offices across the region. And I've been in Singapore for two years. And this is our Asia headquarters. OK, great. Um, I guess maybe we'll go with the, big, the overview question first, which is, is media converging? And if you think so or not, then can you tell us why? Um, maybe start with Shane. So, uh, quick answer, yes. OK, <laughs> thanks. Um, media is converging. It's got a number of different drivers behind it. I think the first one is, of course, is about technology, which is driving fragmentation. We have content that's available on devices. Uh, we have content available on demand. So the user is very much in control. And it's about we need to provide content to all these different channels. And so that's requiring a change in how we think about content, how we produce content, how we distribute it, and how we monetize it. Excellent. And your take on it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at Mashable, we really uh, had this notion of all platform. right? So for our audience, which is predominantly millennial and younger, um, you have to recognize that they're consuming content across the myriad of devices and across the myriad of platforms. Um, so being able to tell stories uh, that resonate uh, on various platforms uh, is key. We all know that creating content is expensive and you need to be efficient. Uh, a lot of our approach is a data-driven approach to that content creation process through uh, some uh, proprietary technology that we have. Hopefully, a chance to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but that helps us, in short, to be more efficient, to figure out the best stories to tell across those platforms. Um, and by the way, that's the same value proposition that we bring to our, our brand partners as well. Great. Thank you very much. Michelle? So uh, we spoke about the technological changes and how they shape the media environment. Uh, I think people spend a lot of time talking about technologies, business model, and they forget that there's an underlying concept that is derived from all of those, but also influencing all of those, and that is people, mm -hmm. uh, the consumer of media. And uh, people today are different than they were 30, 40, 50 years ago, and yet most of the media companies are still trying to uh, capture their attention with the same tool set that was used, uh, you know, 100 years ago and more. And I think that one of the uh, challenges that publishers are facing today, you know, we at Playbuzz, we work with tens of thousands of publishers, 
And we see across the board that uh, it's a lot about, not only about what content you create. So it's not only about, uh, um, you know, the New York Times old slogan of all the news that fits to print. It's also about how you take this content and you structure it and format it in a way that is digestible to a person that consumes their content on a, you know, four inches device and they do that while they're waiting for the bus and suddenly there's a push notification coming in and uh, there used to be very few content creators like, you know, the BBC used to have an entire kingdom to themselves. Now they have to compete with endless array of content creators, not only journalists, but also every reader and influencer that reads something can immediately retweet and elaborate on that and become their own media entity. So in this new environment that's ever changing and ever evolving, I think the trick is how to format the content so it's suitable to the people. Great, thank you very much. So, uh, David, your thoughts? Look, I totally agree. I'm not sure I've got a huge amount to add because I think the three of you covered it. Just coming from, you know, essentially what the BBC is, a content company, you know, I think actually it's a great opportunity now, this kind of democratization of media. And I think we always try and think of the consumer and the storytelling. And I think whatever the technology, whatever the media, there's a huge desire for people to just listen, hear information, entertainment, education, and I think it's certainly converging around that, and that's what we're focusing on. Yep. Excellent. Um, just so you don't always end up last, so <laughs> for the next one, um, what are you guys doing to remain relevant and get good audience engagement? Yeah. So uh, look, the BBC's you know, been around for 100 years, you know, to a certain degree, we're the dinosaur in the room. And I think, you know, from probably over the last 25, all through our, our, our history, we've been trying to innovate. So in the UK, there's lots of things that we're doing to really connect with the consumer in that digital space. So a lot of you might have heard of the BBC iPlayer, which was launched about eight years ago, where we put all of our content that goes on our public service linear channels in a catch-up window. It's massively popular. Uh, I think last year there were 3.6 billion requests for video content in the UK alone, and that's got a population of only 60 million people. Last year we launched BBC Store again in the UK, which is a transactional service where you can download to own video, long form video content. And I think we're the first company to actually take a linear channel totally online. So about three months ago, we took our 16 to, to 34 younger skewing channel, BBC Three, online. So it only exists in that space now. And the creative teams are experimenting with short form content. There's obviously still a lot of commissioning of long form content and using all sorts of social media. So it's an interesting experiment. In Asia, we've got, uh, we're using Singapore actually as a kind of launch pad for a lot of new digital initiatives. And that's partly because it's so massively connected, mobile penetration is fantastic. So last month, we launched a new on-demand drama service called BBC First with our partner Starhub. And effectively, that is available on Starhub Go and on set-top boxes. And I think our belief is that premium drama is consumed increasingly on demand now. People are slightly frustrated having to wait for 8 o'clock every week for an episode on Linear TV. So we just launched that. We're really excited about it. And then later this year, we're launching a BBC player, which again, in partnership with Starhub, is going to be an authenticated on-demand service with all of our content across the genres. You have to subscribe to, to Starhub, but you'll get access to content that's on our six linear, uh, four linear channels plus additional content. We're also going to be offering a download service so you don't have to just stream content. You can actually download it to watch offline. Great, thanks. Um, Shal, what are you doing to remain relevant and have good audience? Uh, so for us, um, you know, the big focus now is on uh, trying to help both publishers and their media partners, the agencies and brands, uh, to leverage the engagement of users on the commercial side, not only on the, on the editorial side. Uh, what we find out is that when uh, agencies and brands create campaigns that are um, in innovative formats, and again, I'll always go back to the packaging of information and how you make the content adjustable to the platform and to the way people consume media, 
uh, you actually get very significant engagement. And it's not about hiding the advertising and make it look like content. On the contrary, it's about making content that is very upfront, uh, commercial, ad sponsored, advertised, but create an experience out of it. And users are very receptive to it. I feel that maybe people have become, uh, you know, I wouldn't say sarcastic or, you know, or cynical, but they acknowledge the fact that even when they're reading the editorial pages of uh, a newspaper or magazine, somebody paid for it. And there are commercial considerations behind it. And I think they are accepting this reality. And as a result, they're saying, look, if you're going to uh, shove down my throat something that somebody paid for, it may as well be tasty. It may as well be, you know, it may as well be engaging and interesting. So you know, I think that uh, an area of focus for us and what we see in the industry is a growing trend is that advertisers leave the standard ad units, the standard uh, um, you know, old school ways of telling a story about their brand and resorting to new formats that are more innovative, more interactive, and more attuned to the, uh, to the social world. Perfect, thanks very much. Uh, Mike. Yeah, I like that about it being tasty. I think I <laughs> have to use that, I'll use that next time. Different panel. Um, for us, I think it's, it's two things. One, uh, trying and failing, trying and succeeding across these platforms. Last year, you know, Meerkat kind of launched at South By, kind of live. Periscope seems to be doing well. Facebook Live pops in. Facebook kind of says, all right, two years ago it was uh, kind of uh, news, then it's video, then it's live. Being responsive and adaptive to that, uh, particularly for an organization of our size, uh, you know, we're roughly only around 300 people globally. Um, but being able to reach the audience that we do, uh, you've got to be able to apply that and apply resource to that. Uh, that means you've got uh, storytellers that are adept at telling those stories, um, kind of buy and for millennials. I think that's really important. And sometimes it can be messy, and sometimes it, it might not work, and I think that's okay. Um, the other approach is kind of uncovering stories locally, and specifically here from Asheville Asia and, and, and the Singaporean market, is to, to focus on those stories that resonate globally. Uh, that's no different than our offices in Sydney or London or LA, et cetera. Um, and it's not so much uh, uh, kind of finding those, those secret bits, but it's acknowledging the fact for us, particularly our remit that is uh, digital culture and internet culture, that you're going to find those stories. And that's what people want. They want to be surprised by the stories um, and, and how we go about that and, and utilizing our uh, proprietary platforms to, to unearth those stories uh, really is what keeps us relevant. Uh, you know, millennials are aging themselves, and you've got Generation Z pulling up. How do you tell the stories in those formats? And I think it's, it's the combination of those two things. Cool, yeah. thanks. Um, Shane? Well, I think for us, there's two kind of real thrusts to when we talk about relevance. Uh, the first one is, as we've been hearing about, is a lot about the audience and how you know, the audience is looking to engage with our content in different ways and how we create content by you know, actively trying new channels and new things and listening to the echoes that we come here coming back. Uh, the other side is on the, the economic side, which is around the business models that we do. So a big part of, for us about staying relevant is about how does an organization of our size, about 3,000 people, concentrated predominantly on one market, remain agile enough and innovate? And in part, the answer is in this room. It's amongst the audience here. Uh, we've taken some big steps in terms of how we co-innovate with partners. So it may be a partner like a Mashable or another brand who's looking to establish a foothold in the region and where we can bring our knowledge and our expertise of this, uh, of this region to bear. Or it could be uh, in terms of the startup and the, uh, that the entrepreneurs who are here in Singapore coming up with the new disruptive business models which they've tapped onto something that uh, the consumers are interested in. They've found a need that we're finding unfulfilled. And then we have the ability to bring our scale, our capital, our reach, and our reputation to bear. So uh, there's, as I say, there's two sides. One is, is very much the audience side. And I agree with very much with what the gents are saying here about how we remain relevant from a content side. But from a business side, it's very important that we are constantly reinventing and changing as our traditional business models are constantly under threat. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It's always uh, a challenge, right? You, you've got to be quick and agile and be able to innovate and, and kind of play around with those new things, but yet the economics and size are things that, that kind of are, are always natural to running a business. And how do you find both or how do you get both? And it, it really is a challenge. And I, I would agree that you know, on the partnership side of things, those certainly help. And you're kind of leveraging the expertise of, of both parties. Great. Um, so that leads us to maybe looking at the future. So maybe, Shal, what, what are you excited about, about for the future? What trends? 
Thank you. My uh, crystal ball shows that, uh, you know, the old debate whether, we, whether content is king or the medium is the message, I think is being uh, close to being set and the medium is winning. Uh, it's now less about creating good, uh, great content or, you know, being a great content creator, uh, having the credibility of uh, being a great uh, content creator. It's more about uh, the platform. People discover content primarily on Facebook and, you know, let's assume maybe Snapchat and Twitter and Pinterest have a little bit of skin in that game as well, but it's primarily Facebook. And your goal as a content creator is to create content that's adjustable to those platforms because it used to be, you know, in the new, uh, in the, um, uh, a few weeks ago in the uh, New France, uh, some uh, chief something officer of the New York Times, I forget who it was, said that their uh, answer to the future, their strategy for the future is to create great content. And, uh, you know, it sounds great, but they've been doing it for 200 years. And the honest to God truth is uh, that nobody really cares if they create what they call great content anymore. You know, if this is going to pop up in their uh, Facebook news feed, people are going to click on it. If something else is going to pop up there, they're going to click on something else. So, you know, building this credibility of, you know, we know how to tell a story, we know how to create great content, still has merit, it's still important, but it's not nearly as important as it used to be if nobody's listening. And I think, you know, really the uh, challenge is uh, how to adapt to these platforms. And they change all the time, right? I mean, nobody spoke about Snapchat in Unbound a year ago, and now it's probably the fifth time that I'm mentioning it, in, you know, in, uh, in this sentence. And who knows what it's going to be next year. The platforms are changing, the forms of storytelling are, are evolving, and our ro the role of publishers used to be to curate the entire content consumption experience. Now it's more like to create good products and ship them out, try to promote them on those different platforms. In a way, the role of the publisher has changed from being uh, the retailer of content to being only a product on the shelf of a massive mall together with many other products and, you know, create a product that stands out, that people are more attracted to, that people are more aware of, that creates a better experience but it's about creating a product, not about curating the entire uh, content experience. Cool. So, Mike, what are you excited about at Mashable? Yeah, I mean, I, I really agree with that. I mean, that's kind of a lot of what, what we espouse. I mean, I think um, for us, uh, this notion of kind of audience with a capital A, where you've got um, uh, brand partners that want that reach and that extension uh, on Snapchat Discover, so we sell into that platform and, and uh, as do they. Um, but then you've got uh, our partners with Turner uh, to be able to develop that on, on a branded content side as well. Uh, that means that we're, you know, kind of working with a, a host of other media companies as well. Bravo, uh, kind of division of NBC, uh, but on OTT plays as well for on the telcos, on Watchable and Go90. Um, so the key is to be across all those platforms, I think, um, to tell good stories. Yes, 100%, and that's almost a, a prereq. Uh, and then to make sure that you've got the ability to reach that audience. Um, and the sands are shifting. I think, you know, there is going to be measurement tools and metrics that will determine that across the board. A little bit of what we were chatting about b before, uh, before on stage. And I think the goal is, it's a tall order. You've got to create great content. You've got to be across all those platforms. And you've got to make sure that you've got the reach and scale. And I think, you know, all of those are challenging. Um, and you try to build as many of those blocks together. Cool. And so what are you guys excited about? Well, I think the, the, what we're excited about is the glue that's holding all of this together. And we haven't talked about this yet. Um, obviously, the most talked about topic in the last couple of years is big data. And what does that mean for all sorts of organizations? Well, uh, what it means for media companies is a couple of things. The first thing is on the creation side. We have all these different channels and platforms that we're experimenting with. And we need to understand how our content is performing. So how do we aggregate those insights into how our content creation process? So for us, that's a big part of what we're doing now is pulling these insights, not just from our digital properties, but from our television, from our radio, from our catch-up service, from even from outdoor, with some very interesting innovations that we're doing with our outdoor sites and facial recognition technology. So we pull that all together, and that helps us to create the content. On the flip side of there is the commercial side, which is how do we actually look at this data and this content and see what impact that's having for our advertising partners? Because we have to create uh, 
compelling user experiences using content nowadays to order to unlock advertising dollars. The old model of interruptive ads or banners or pre-rolls is seriously under challenge now. Consumers are really starting to feel up more and more uncomfortable with that form of advertising. So for us, the commercial side and, the, and I guess the customer engagement side go hand in hand and the glue that holds it together is data. And that's the bit that we're most excited about. Cool. So how does the BBC sit on that one? <clears throat> well, look, in the short term, I'm very excited about our, our product launch in Singapore. And I think, you know, going into that digital space, and we've been there a little bit in, in Asia uh, up till now, but mostly through aggregator sites and third parties, is I'm really excited for my team. I think, you know, there's lots of learnings in terms of how people consume online video compared to linear video. Um, I think, you know, there's the use, I mean, certainly we're using social media uh, more as a marketing tool rather than a, a kind of, you know, a new uh, a kind of business model to make money. Um, I, I just want to pick up one thing. I mean, we do feel that curation is really important. I, I just think there's a couple of things going on now. You know, there's just been such a growth of different services that you can get um, across news, across long form entertainment content. Some of them don't work very well, and I think there's an impatience now amongst consumers. You know, anybody who's got teenage kids, I mean, you know, if it doesn't work within a couple of seconds, forget it. So I think there's that, and we're working really hard to make sure that that's a really quality product. I think the other thing is there's also places where there's just a massive bucket of content that's driven very much by algorithms. And I think, you know, where we come, which is much more that editorial sensibility, we want to put some curation back into that. So guiding people, making connections with content so that they can discover in different ways. So that's a bit of an experiment, and we'll see how that goes, and we can adapt it as it goes along. Cool. Um, we're getting questions from the audience, so uh, thanks for that. Um, one of the ones is, is the media dependent on platforms such as Facebook and Snapchat, and how do you manage that? Uh, Mike, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, for sure. Look, you can never leverage your business model uh, to third parties exclusively, nor can you ignore the fact uh, that your audience is there. Um, so you have to choose to participate in that mm. and participate in it well. Yeah. Um, I think Mashable is uh, fortunate that as a media company globally, we've got scale. It's not the largest scale, but it is of scale. And there's certain, certainly a lot of brand equity in the marketplace right? that is built upon authenticity. And that authenticity lends itself to these other kind of emerging platforms. Uh, they are great business models. They do provide scale. Um, it's really interesting, right? Facebook allows branded content now through those partnerships where you, you keep the, the, the revenue, right? They sell ads against it. That's an amazing opportunity, a distribution channel that will probably likely change over time. Um, but being a part of that and being recognized as a, uh, as an alpha partner within that or, or the likes of Snapchat as well, then you, know, you have to actively pursue those. Um, but absolutely, people are still consuming content across those channels and being driven back to site, right? It's, uh, are, you, are they in the formats? For us, branded content native advertising uh, runs in stream. Our you know, mobile web is predominantly the way in which we serve that up, and it has been since 2012. Uh, that responsive nature was very early and predictive in terms of figuring out the ways that people wa wanted to consume content. Um, so that lent itself to then working naturally with Facebook and Snapchat and, and others. Um, so the answer is yes, you have to, but you've got to be careful that it's not 100% that way. It doesn't eat you. Yes. Um, Shane, what's your take on that? Um, I can probably be a little more direct, I think. I think the relationship you have with these, uh, these channels is they rely on premium content themselves. You know, the, the fact is even ch uh, mature social media uh, platforms like Facebook are undergoing great change. You know, more and more consumers are sharing less personal information about themselves, and there's more and more branded, uh, funded content that's appearing on those channels. So it's a, it's a case, I think, of mutual exploitation mm. and, and being agile enough to actually get more from these channels channels than, uh, than you put in. So for us, I, I tend to agree um, uh, that it is a promotional vehicle for us. We, it's a way for us for, to help consumers discover our television content uh, and, and new ideas and that we want to experiment with. Um, but it's also a way for us to have a conversation with our consumers. So we don't just see it as a channel by which we distribute content. It's a way that we have conversations with consumers. So it's part of our entire customer experience. Um, I think also I agree that in terms of new platforms that are coming along all the time, 
there's a, a period of time that happens at the beginning, and um, I hope there's some people in this audience now who have the next great social platform, do come and see me about it afterwards, uh, where we can again leverage this, this, the established nature of our business, the quality content that we have, and this too can enhance these up and coming social platforms as well. Mm -hmm. So it's no, you know, uh, you know, if you look at, say, Snapchat, for example, Snapchat was a great social media channel with no monetization strategy. It was only when you started to introduce companies like Mashable and letting brands experiment by creating content for that channel did it actually become uh, a marketable business. Yeah I, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think the reality is, as media companies, and make no doubt, they're not social media companies, they are media companies, uh, they recognize that creating content is tough and, and that they need us as much as, as we need them. And I think that that approach, uh, you know, how far will they push that? You know, we'll see. I do know that it's they want that diversity of voice too. They don't only want Mashable; they want the BBC and they want a host of other brands, right? It's all about having that diversity of voice, and I think they're smart enough to recognize that. The question is ultimately, will they end up uh, having significant pressure on their own monetization strategies? And once that's the case, then I think you know the media companies really need to uh, media companies, meaning us, uh, really need to keep an eye on that. Cool. Um, Platforms for you, David, is it an issue or how do you manage that? <clears throat> I think like um, Shane said, I mean, we use you know, all of those platforms as a promotional vehicle. I think, I think we've got to be careful in the future that you don't just end up with a few really massive, big, mostly US-based media conglomerates that kind of own everything. So I think you know, we certainly in all of our you know, distribution deals want to deal with a lot of different people. And I think the danger is if you just end up in, you know, Facebook or one of those, then there's, there's, uh, I think it only goes one way. And I don't think it's just Facebook. I think same with global SVOD. You know, I think there's, we've got a very good relationship with, with Amazon, with, with Netflix. You know, they're going rapidly after global market share. And I think, again, you've just got to balance that with your own products and, and, and other people's. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Cheryl? Uh, I got nothing much to add. I don't have to say that uh, I think the power shift is definitely towards the, the platforms and not the content providers. Uh, you're saying they need you as much as you need them. I tend, I tend to disagree. I think that maybe for the short term, you know, they uh, use you as part of onboarding people, getting them used to consume your content on their platform. But then people are getting used to consume content on those, on those platforms. And that content is a little bit interchangeable. It's not as unique as it used to be. Uh, and the position of power for the publisher, unfortunately, is, uh, is no longer there. I'm optimistic, though, because I think two things. First of all, consumers are more receptive to consume content than ever before. You know, we're all obsessively checking our phone to see what's new. You know, what happened in the last five minutes since I last checked, you know, last checked in? What, you know, what else is up? So people are actually interested in content more than, uh, more than ever before. And also those platforms, as powerful as they may be, they always change. I mean, you know, only 20 years ago, which isn't, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that much of a time, no, none of us could imagine an internet outside of AOL, right? I mean, the last time I heard, they, they were acquired by a telco uh, for about a fraction of about 1% of the total uh, uh, value they had at some point. So mm. just to say empires rise and fall pretty quickly in this era because people are changing and because the models are changing. So, you know, as a media company, I think, uh, you know, what these guys are doing is smart. They're adapting to the new platforms that come along. And uh, yes, they are, to some extent, at their mercy. And this is a particular point in time in which everybody's at the mercy of one big, huge American conglomerate that pretty much has a monopoly. Uh, I don't think it's gonna stay. You know, I think that those things are always bound for change. They'll always evolve and new things will come out. So eventually, the publisher does have a role in every future ecosystem of media. It's just a very different role than what they used to have uh, years ago. And you know, it takes time to adapt to changes. Even though everybody's nodding, everybody understands that. But in the practice, in the day-to-day, -day, they're still very much tied to, to practices that have been working for them for dozens of years. And it takes time to shift away from them. Cool. Um, uh, one of our top trending questions um, is about W is, is print done? But I'd maybe change that to say, start with you, Mike. I mean, is it, but does it matter? I mean, you're a good example, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that print per se is necessarily dead. I, I don't know that 
uh, for news uh, that, that that would is going to be the case. I think over time, certainly for our audience, um, there's obviously huge components of the world that continue to read print, and, and that is not going away anytime soon. So I, I don't think that it's it's dead. Uh, you know, just like I don't think that that reading fiction is dead on on books either. Um, I do think that uh, you know the, the question of uh, you know, just as much as, as I would say, I would take that question a step further and say, you know, the, the text-based articles are not going to die either. I think there's a lot of, like, people that are very concerned that it's all image-based or video-based or short-form video-based. Those are huge and really amazing ways to tell stories. Um, but for us, you know, written articles are as important and will continue to be as important. Um, the way in which they're consumed is no different on whether it's print or a website mm. or one of the platforms we spoke about. Um, I think you have to be responsive to your market and what they want. So as long as there's that opportunity, there should be print, there should be websites, and there should be all these emerging platforms. Yeah, but well, you know, well, newspapers actually grew last year. I don't know if everybody knew that. New global newspaper mm. circulation was up nearly 4% last year. And a lot of that growth is coming from developing countries and emerging marketplaces. Uh, and there's a lot of them here in this region that experience growth because there are still places where, uh, as delightful as digital is, that you still need certain things like a certain amount of income to, avoid a, uh, to afford a smartphone or a PC. You need to have stable electricity, and of course, you need to have an internet connection. There's still lots of places in the world where that isn't the case. So I don't think print is, is, is dead. I think print as we knew it is a completely different business model now. Print as a, f as a facet of an integrated media company I think will exist for a long time. There's a lot of people who have great affection for print, the medium of print. Uh, it's a visceral medium that's hard to replicate, yeah. but I do think it's gonna become more and more niche in, those, in the developed marketplaces. It's gonna become a, a specialist medium where you can confer content upon someone in a physical state. Like a vinyl kind of. Vinyl's back up again as yeah. well. <laughs> Um, so another question that's doing well, and I think it's one maybe we all think about is, you know, is it harder to monetize with a younger audience who are used to freemium? Um, who, Shao, do you want to jump in first? I think that when we talk about the younger audiences, slash uh, Generation Z, Millennials, whatever you call uh, this group of people, uh, there's a perception, you know, if we ask people in the audience, what do they think about the millennial generation, they would say that these people are uh, very text heavy, uh, very jumpy, they don't have any loyalty, they jump from one thing to the other, and they're very lazy. And, uh, you know, I want to point the mirror back and say, you know, you guys are the lazy ones. Uh, you know, these guys, as I said, they're very <coughs> proactive. They're checking their phone all the time, they're looking for content. They don't want to read very lengthy articles about things that only matter to them to a certain extent. You know, we, we got the news that everything you know, every simple thing in life, like a football game, the only way to cover it is to write two pages all about exactly what happened in the football game. It's not very interesting. The result matters. You know, the picture of their celebrating team matters. Maybe a couple of stats, you know, maybe a couple of sentences. The rest just doesn't matter. So, you know, I think it's a, the laziness is for the content creator to adapt and create content that matters in the format that matters. I don't think that the young generation is lazy. I think there's a, I agree with you, there's a big opportunity. Uh, they're very receptive. Media is accessible everywhere. Uh, you know, to the previous point, it doesn't really matter if print is dying or not because the same great content is now available in other forms. Um, it's just about making sure that uh, the content experience is uh, adjusting to the way people are consuming it and that that way has changed significantly. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, people should be paying for content and, and working through that. Uh, you know, I subscribe, I pay for content. I also find amazing content on Mashable. And I, I think millennials and younger, um, they pay for content too. The question is ultimately, you know, what's ultimately your audience, right? If you want to tell stories about uh, digital technology and, and internet culture, that component lends itself more to an ad-based model and a brand-based model. Uh, millennials and younger, really have strong brand affinity. They want to engage in brands. They want brands to be a part of that experience. And so that lends itself to native advertising, which is our primary USP for telling stories for brands on, uh, on that behalf. Mashable has a lot of great brand affinity itself globally, and brands want to be a part of that, and that's great, and our audience responds to that. If you tell great stories with them, then, then that ad model works in a significant way, and I think that will continue to work that way for us just because that's our model doesn't mean that, that paid is going away anytime soon, and paid has its own rights in, in other types of stories and other types of uh, practices. Cool. 
David, do you want to say anything about monetization? Yeah. <coughs> Look, I think, I think, you know, if you've got great content, depends on what your business model, whether it's free or paid, they'll, they'll come to it. So uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about piracy. And I think, you know, look, as an industry, media industry, I think we've been a bit of fault. You know, younger generation, as you've had this kind of internet revolution, we haven't necessarily made our content available when people want to watch it. You know, I'm talking mostly long form video, you know, on the devices that they want to consume it. So they've gone elsewhere in that pirate market. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to change that. And I think, you know, there's an unanswered question, really, because this generation is growing up. And I guess they're tipping, you know, the start of it's tipping into adulthood. You know, as they become more established, you know, will they then start to pay for content? It's a debate I often have with my kids. And I think we also need to make the connection between Look, if you want to have great content, doesn't matter what it is, someone has to pay for it. That's absolutely right. Interestingly, uh, particularly for 18 to 24 year old tech savvy men, uh, there was some research there, both out of the US and the UK, about the increasing use of ad blockers. And what was really interesting is amongst that group, ad blocking is, is often as high as 50%. And for those not familiar with ad blocking, it's, it's a browser based technology that strips out uh, uh, the, the server calls that pull down ads and cookies onto your browser. Um, what was really interesting is the response that many publishers took, publishers like Forbes and publishers like The Garden. They actually put up a page that says, hey, we can see you using an ad blocker. You do realize that this pays for your content. And what was really interesting in the research is 30% of the audience that was surveyed by the IAB in the UK had no idea that the ads were paying for the content. <laughs> so Haymarket actually have taken that one stage further. If you go to a Haymarket page with an ad blocker on, they actually say, look, we're hiring all these great writers, producing this great quality content about football. Um, if you're using an ad blocker, we're going to have to let some people go. In fact, this is the guy that we're going to let go. <laughs> So he's going to get fired. So please, let's not fire this guy. Switch your ad blocker off. And what's really interesting is in different experiments is the number of people who are prepared to pay for content or switch their ad blockers off as a result of that educational period there. So I think for millennials, let's not give up on them. They're, they have other things to worry about than our business models and whether we're making yeah. money. They've got life and the universe to, and all the world's problems to solve. Um, and I, I agree that eventually they will grow up. I think the last thing I'd add on that is millennials aren't the end all and be all. As a, from a marketer's standpoint, they're amongst the least valuable consumers we have. They're not making as many um, high value business decisions uh, also. So uh, I think for brands who want to create a brand association early on, I think they're incredibly important because we make these lifelong brand connections that we that carry through as consumers for the rest of our lives quite often. Uh, and I think it's important from that point of view. But I think let's not get too hung up because they can be educated and they will grow up. Cool. Um, we're almost done, but there's one question I would like us to talk briefly, which is about VR. And like, we're big fans of it, but obviously the questions are asking, is it just a fad? So who'd like to take that? David, yeah? Yeah. <coughs> um, you know, I think a lot of people compared VR with 3D. I think 3D was a gimmick and a fad. I think VR is something <coughs> fairly fundamental in terms of how you can change the way you tell story, do tell stories. And look, it's really at its infancy, and I think anything that involves you to put on a massive headset is going to be slightly challenging. I think there's huge applications already with gamers. Um, but I've seen some content. We're developing some content with some of the big VR um, producers. And you know, it's the first innovation for kind of 20, 30 years where the whole grammar of storytelling is different. And if anybody has seen a, a small clip of a, a horror sequence in VR, it's a truly breathtaking experience. So you know, if you can develop that, whether it eventually goes to long form, don't know. But we're certainly experimenting at the BBC with our natural history content, which is all about landscapes. And I think when you suddenly have a different perspective, it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that in porn, probably. Mm -hmm in terms yeah. of gaming and porn, yeah. that's probably about it. Yeah. Uh, but Hor, you're absolutely right. I think you, you recognize the fact that what's the type of story that you want to tell? Mm -hmm. And so uh, certainly if you can uh, get an individual like in the ground, on the center, on, on a situation that's happening, you're giving them an immersive experience. Yeah. Absolutely, gaming is that as well. Um, the question is making sure, like any other format, the story that you're telling, does it really, does it really fit that medium? And so I, I agree, I don't think it's a fad, I think, uh, half joking about that before, but uh, but I think that there is a huge component yeah. for storytelling across the board. It's just making sure that it might not necessarily be applicable to every media company. Yeah. Can you imagine John? consuming news 
uh, that you're reading about, I don't know, an earthquake somewhere, and rather than just reading about it, you're putting your uh, VR glasses and now you're feeling the earth trembling. You know, I'm not sure that people want to consume uh, content that way. <laughs> uh, to your point, I think it's a lot about, it's not a binary question. VR has existed for more than a generation. Nothing really evolved in the technology other than the fact that it's now becoming commoditized to the point where it becomes something for personal use, potentially. Um, you know, TPD of, uh, you know, I don't think it's either going to be a Fed or uh, going to take over uh, the entire world of content. It's going to be somewhere in between. The question is what kind of stories, what kind of experience are best suited for that? I can personally think that uh, it's going to be great to have a video conference with someone and feel like you're sitting and chatting with them live. You know, I can see that as a good implication, implication of it. Uh, then there are challenges of, you know, the fact that it takes over your entire, that it's full immersion. Um, usually technologies are successful when they combine into your day-to-day -day, like mobile phones did and not when they are completely changing the way that you operate. Uh, so, you know, I'm curious as you are to see what kind of experience will really be organic and resonate and not yeah. imposed by a new technology just for the sake of its availability. Yeah. Cool. And Shane, I, I think the, the success or otherwise is going to come down to uh, the, the content because it's not just about us working out how to tell stories in these new medium. Uh, when television came along in the 50s, people didn't know how to tell stories on the small screen, so they had to figure that out. They've been used to dealing with on the silver screen. So we've got to figure out as storytellers how we're going to tell stories uh, that's going to be content that's going to be sufficiently compelling to overcome the fundamental barrier that VR has, which is you have to be in a safe, controlled environment where you're willing to sub submerse yourself in a way that suddenly you're at the mercy of your environment. The other part is, is about it's how do we make this a shared experience? You know, we talked about gaming. Gaming uh, uh, gamers have for a long time been participating in games, which are you know uh, have multiple players. They're communicating. They're using headsets. They're using devices. The technology is very much part of that experience. But for the rest of us, the technology kind of gets in the way. Uh, 3D television is the most recent example where. Many of us weren't even prepared to put on the 3D glasses to experience that content, and it's, it's kind of dying a slow death just at the moment. So how do we make our content so compelling that people are willing to give up uh, that, uh, that convenience factor uh, when, they, when they put the glasses on? Excellent. Um, so I've really enjoyed listening to the guys. I want to say thanks to um, Shane, Mike, yeah, Shaul, and David. And um, thank you very much. If you could give them a round of applause. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's right.